In this lesson, you'll learn about multiples of the square root of minus 1, the so-called imaginary numbers. You'll also be introduced to complex numbers, numbers that are both real and imaginary. But before we begin, let's be clear about what you can expect if you're not already familiar with imaginary numbers. Some people will tell you that there's nothing imaginary about imaginary numbers. The truth is, you are going to have to use your imagination if you want to get to grips with them. It's not at all obvious how imaginary numbers relate to the real world, which means lots of people will never come across them. And many of those who do will find them challenging, to say the least. Nonetheless, imaginary and complex numbers are well worth getting to know if you're a student of computing or science, because they are so incredibly useful. They've been crucial in the development of computer graphics, animation, Wi-Fi, artificial intelligence, quantum computers, and so much more. To understand imaginary numbers, you need to appreciate negative numbers first. The concept of negative numbers didn't emerge until around 200 BC in China, and it was a concept that even the Romans didn't fully grasp. From an early age, even as we're learning to talk, we learn to count using positive whole numbers, the so-called natural numbers. Then, in school, from as young as eight or nine years old, we're introduced to negative whole numbers. We learn to visualise them alongside positive numbers on a number line. These are called integers. We learn that negative numbers can represent how much you owe someone, how far you've moved backwards instead of forwards, cold instead of hot, naughty instead of nice, and so on. And because we learn about negative numbers from such an early age, we're quite comfortable with them, unlike the Romans. Ask any ten-year-old what's three minus seven, and they can probably tell you it's negative four. As we get older, we learn more about different types of numbers, some of which can seem very peculiar indeed. Mathematics teachers tell us that every real number is located somewhere on the number line, a one-dimensional structure extending forever in both directions. And real numbers are not just natural numbers and integers. They include fractions and decimals, and even irrational numbers with their infinitely recurring decimal places. You might even come across surreal numbers, those that extend beyond infinity, and the infinite number of infinitesimally small numbers that exist in the gaps between all the others. An abstract number line is nevertheless a particularly useful tool for thinking about arithmetic involving negative numbers. Let's quickly recap. To visualise multiplying two positive numbers together, like 2 times 3, we can imagine this car moving two places to the right three times. Minus 2 times 3 is like putting the car into reverse gear and moving backwards two places three times. Two times minus three can be thought of as moving two places forwards three times, but facing in the other direction. So the car moves forwards from its reversed perspective three times. Which gives the same result as minus two times three. Minus two times minus three is like moving backwards two places three times, whilst also facing the other way. So we get the same result as positive 2 times positive 3. One negative sign causes a 180 degree reversal of direction, but 2 result in two 180 degree reversals, which means no change in direction at all. This leads us to a set of rules for multiplying together numbers with different signs. Rules which a 10 year old can apply quite happily. When it comes to squaring numbers, the same rules apply. 3 times 3 moves the car 9 places forwards. Or, to put that another way, 3 squared 
is 9. We say the square root of 9 is equal to 3. Minus 3 times minus 3 means reverse direction first, then move in the opposite direction 9 places. The square root of 9 is also minus 3. In other words, 9 has two possible square roots, 3 or minus 3. Most high school students are comfortable with these calculations and happily accept the idea that the number 9 can be made in different ways. But if you think about it, it's a little weird, isn't it? That two numbers, which are both less than nothing, can be multiplied together to make something. As we get older, we learn to model real-world problems using algebraic expressions like this one, for example. And we learn to simplify these equations by applying established rules, including rules that fit with our understanding of negative numbers. But occasionally, things stop making sense, like when we need to find the square root of a negative number. For example, what is the square root of minus 9? What number, when multiplied by itself, gives us minus 9? It can't be two positive numbers because that would give us a positive result. And it can't be two negative numbers because that would also give us a positive result. And it can't be one of each because they wouldn't be the same number. The rules of algebra allow us to express this as the square root of minus 1 times the square root of positive 9, which is the square root of minus 1 times 3. But we're still faced with the unanswerable question, what is the square root of minus 1? What number, when multiplied by itself, gives us minus 1? We can get closer to an explanation if we think of numbers geometrically rather than algebraically. That is, if we think in terms of points, lines and shapes. In the 1600s, the French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes invented the Cartesian plane. According to legend, he was trying to describe the location of a fly on his ceiling. This system uniquely describes the position of a point in two-dimensional space using a pair of real numbers as coordinates. So a simple shape like a square can be described with four pairs of coordinates. And by applying simple operations like addition and multiplication to each corner, it's possible to transform the shape. These transformations include translation, dilation, reflection and rotation. Animated computer graphics depend on being able to perform tens of thousands of calculations like these many times a second. So how does geometry help us to understand the square root of minus 1? Let's think again about our one-dimensional number line, or at least part of it. Minus 1 can be represented as a line segment like this. And minus 1 squared gives us positive 1, which you can see is like rotating the line segment 180 degrees. Minus 1 cubed is like a 180 degree rotation followed by another. And minus 1 to the power of 4 is like three 180 degree rotations. Each time we multiply the result by another minus 1, we bring about another 180 degree rotation. Now, imagine we have another number line perpendicular to the original one. And imagine that this number line includes multiples of the square root of minus 1. And let's be absolutely clear, this is another dimension, but it's not a spatial dimension. We are not trying to pinpoint flies on the ceiling. Thinking of these number lines as x and y dimensions in space is a conceptual trap. To make sense of this imaginary dimension, we must allow ourselves to think outside of the box. This, by the way, is called the complex plane, for reasons you'll soon see. Let's zoom in and take a closer look at its geometric properties. 
We know that the square root of minus 1 squared is equal to minus 1. Of course it is. The square root of any number squared is the number itself. We can represent the square root of minus 1 on the complex plane as a line segment, like this. And to transform it to minus 1, we can rotate it through 90 degrees. So it would seem that multiplying by the square root of minus 1 is equivalent to a 90 degree rotation. But is this always the case? If we multiply the previous result by the square root of minus 1 again, we get minus the square root of minus 1. So by raising the square root of minus 1 to the power of 3, we have effectively rotated it by 180 degrees. When the square root of minus 1 is raised to the power of 4, we get positive 1. It's not quite so obvious why, but remember, we've already established that the square root of minus 1 squared is minus 1, and now we've done that twice, so we have minus 1 times minus 1, which we know is positive 1. This result can be represented with a 270 degree rotation. Finally, the square root of minus 1 raised to the power of 5 must be equal to the square root of minus 1 because it's equivalent to 1 times the square root of minus 1. Effectively, a full 360 degree rotation. Notice that each time we raise the square root of minus 1 to another power, we effectively rotate it by another 90 degrees. So what does this pattern suggest? Well, Firstly, that we can describe multiples of the square root of minus 1 in geometric terms, just like we can real numbers. Geometry is one of the oldest branches of mathematics, and it was originally all about shapes and objects, and the space they occupy. But we can represent all manner of abstract concepts in geometric terms, if we like. Secondly, that there's a tangible relationship between real numbers and multiples of the square root of minus 1. The fact that we can solve so many real-world problems using these special values, as you'll see, is testament to the fact. And thirdly, that we are not restricted to just real numbers on a one-dimensional number line. We can have as many perpendicular dimensions as we like. If you're finding that hard to swallow, just remember that only a few hundred years ago, Negative numbers were thought of as ridiculous by many a respected mathematician. You've already moved well beyond simple counting numbers. Gerolamo Cardano, an Italian physician, theologian, astronomer and of course mathematician, was one of the first people to recognise the existence of this special value in 1545. He used it to solve quadratic and cubic equations that could otherwise not be solved. But at the time, Cardano said that his own solutions were clever but false. Cardano, by the way, was also a compulsive gambler, who, perhaps ironically, gives his name to a modern cryptocurrency platform. A few years later, in 1574, another Italian... Raphael Bombelli published a book entitled Algebra. His aim was to explain the rules of algebra in simple terms that almost anyone could understand. He spelt out detailed rules for doing algebra with the special value that Cardano had discovered. Bombelli was declared a master of the analytical art by some of the most revered mathematicians of the day. In 1637, René Descartes said that the square roots of negative numbers had no place in serious mathematical work, referring to them with contempt as imaginary numbers. Little did he know at the time just how useful they would one day become, and that the name he had given them would stick. In the 1700s, Swiss-born Leonard Euler, who, by the way, is considered by many to have been one of the greatest mathematicians that ever lived, made extensive use of imaginary numbers in the fields of science and astronomy. Euler used the letter I to symbolise the square root of minus 1. 
and this is the symbol we still use in mathematics today. So what exactly are complex numbers? Let's return to the complex plane. And for convenience, let's relabel the imaginary dimension. You've seen that a line segment can be used to represent the imaginary unit. In fact, any multiple of the imaginary unit can be represented in the same way. A line segment can also represent a real number, as you know. So what about this line segment? Or this one? Or this one? This line segment represents a number that is part real and part imaginary. This is called a complex number, and it can be written like this. And if you think about it, there must be an infinite number of complex numbers. In fact, even a real number can be thought of as a complex number, it's just that the imaginary component is zero. In another lesson, you'll learn more about complex numbers, including an alternative way to write them down and how to perform useful calculations with them.